Welcome to the Wired to Hunt podcast, your home for deer hunting news, stories, and strategies. And now, your host, Mark Kenyon. Welcome to the Wired to Hunt podcast. I'm your host, Mark Kenyon, and this is episode number 35. Today in the show, Dan and I are discussing late season plans and problems. So here we go. Welcome to the Wired to Hunt podcast. And today in the show, it's just me and Dan sitting here in Michigan and Iowa, connected simply by a couple sets of headphones, two mics, the internet, and a common addiction to hunting whitetails. So Dan, how the heck are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Mark. I uh, had one of those, I'm having one of those weeks though, I'm, and I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about, where... Um, Yesterday, I go down into my laundry room, and there's water dripping out of my ceiling. Mm. And, and so I, I'm like, what the hell's going on? So I, I go back up to my kitchen and notice that every time I run the faucet, there's a hole in the line somewhere, and it's been leaking down in t- behind the drywall on the ceiling um, and going over top of my home's electrical box. Oh, and geez. getting the floor in my laundry room wet. So I had to take drywall off the ceiling and off the walls and get a fan in there and dry it all out, clean it all up and fix the faucet. And then today at work, I had one of those days where I, I don't ever want to sound like I'm a violent person, but I <laughs> wish I could take a hammer and smash my computer and maybe some hands of some coworkers. Maybe we might have to edit that out because there, I think there's some people where I work that listen to this, but I think they understand. So yeah, well, yeah, let's smash the desk, right? <laughs> smash, smash the yeah. desk. Smash the desk. <laughs> oh man. Well, sorry to hear that. First and foremost, and well, I imagine you probably can't divulge too much of of why all that stuff, but I, I'm sure many of us can relate to just how work can do that to you sometimes. Right. Right. But the good thing is, is I took a little, I took a little moment of Zen break and, uh, I went to Google maps. Like I always do. I spend, you know, several hours a week on there and just looked at the property and had (laughs) dreams about next year or, you know, kind of planning already, even though this season's not over planning for, uh, next season a little bit. So yeah, that right there, whitetail therapy, it's, it's the best right now. I understand you just got back from Indiana. It's true. It's true. I did. And you told me you weren't going to talk with me about it before we started recording. So now can we talk about it? Yeah. It's okay. uh, a pretty exciting story. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't want to talk to you about it off the air because I really want to come out with this first and foremost, in the first place here on the Wired to Hunt podcast. I had one of the most horrible hunts of my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say, dude, I saw a giant. I wish. Dude, I hunted. Um, now, not, not for a terribly long time. It was a three-day trip. But over the course of three days, I saw a grand total of zero deer. Not a single deer. And I mean, I'm not talking just even within shooting range or you know on my property. I didn't even see a deer 2,000 yards away on the neighboring property. I didn't see a deer while driving around the roads in the morning or the evening after hunting or during the middle of the day. I didn't even see a roadkill deer. I didn't see a single living, breathing deer. Not one. Wow. Yeah. Did you have, did you have trail cameras up on that property? I did not. Now, uh, my okay. friend, my friend who was hunting this property before me, had cameras up um, in the summer and September into October, and he had a good number of deer on the camera, numerous shooters, so some good bucks. And so I came in, you know, expecting, with high hopes at least, you know, and I I hunted in November and and saw nothing but does and a spike. And then I came back now and I thought, okay, the standing corn that ruined my hunt last time or what I thought was hurting my hunt last time, that's going to be down. I'm going to get here. Those deer are going to be moving out to feed in the cut cornfield. It's going to be great. And uh, nope, I did not see 
anything. Um, and on top of that, the day I, the first day I got there, um, I pulled in and this property to, there's a big, there's a Creek that runs right through the middle of property. And you know, when I was there in November, it was just a, like an ankle high Creek. You would just cross in your, in your knee boots. Um, and, and you really had, you had to cross that to get to any of the property that was really huntable. Um, cause on the road side of the Creek was just a cut bean field. There was nothing there, nothing really to hunt. So I knew I was going to have to cross that Creek to get to the back side of the property where all the action would be. So I, um, I, you know, set up, I got my portable stand hung up on my uh, backpack and I got my climbing sticks all strapped on and I got my muzzle loader and I got my, um, I brought an extra winter coat packed in my backpack and I had all these things. My backpack probably weighed like 65 pounds. And so already I'm just kind of irritated that I'm hiking in with this and I start hiking in and I get to the Creek and the Creek isn't a Creek anymore. It's just a full blown river. It's like 35 yards across now and like raging it looks like chocolate milk with just rothing boils and uh, white water almost rapids it seemed like it was there's so much water coursing through this now river um i just stood there like wow i mean there's no way in the world i'm getting across that in my boots um so i kind of <laughs> I, I, I stood there for probably just five minutes just like kind of silently cursing to myself and like what in the world am I gonna do? So I kind of walked up and down trying to see if there's any, you know, chance like a big tree across that I might that I might be able to shimmy across. But even if there was, I don't know if I'd do it because it was like downright dangerous how heavy the flow was through that river. Um, so then I was like, okay. Now what in the world am I gonna do? Am I gonna? Uh, there's no way to get across. So I either need to go buy a pair of waders and see if I can wade across this. And even I tested the depth with like a stick and it was, it was, it might even been too deep to wade across. It was that, um, it was way up above the banks. Um, sounds like, well, I could go buy like a rubber raft and try to like, you know, raft across this thing. But then, I mean, can you imagine how ridiculous that would be if I tried to put a portable tree stand, climbing sticks, my backpack, me and all my hunting gear in a little rubber raft, and then try to raft across this raging, you know, 50 foot, your 50 yard wide river and then see me, you know, colliding down the river, hitting trees, tipping over, capsizing. It, it mean, would have been what would have happened. It would have been just me on the podcast today saying, well, I'm sorry, but Mark Kenning is no longer with us. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I mean, you'd probably be a great host all by yourself, but I just, I wouldn't care for it that much. If <laughs> 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 this isn't the Dallas Fort Worth show. <laughs> I think you know I wouldn't even, that wouldn't even bother me. I think it just mostly be the fact I was dead. That might be the part that would be a downer for me. <laughs> yeah, that would kind of suck. Yeah, that would suck. Yeah, and you know, I don't have very good luck with creeks and rivers in the first place, as you know. You know, right. last time I tried to cross a river with you, I fell through the ice up to my shoulders. About died then too. Maybe but, you should just like go out west. Or like to the plains in like Nebraska and Kansas where there's not a lot of rivers. Just avoid all water sources. That might exactly. might be my best bet. But um I ended up being smart about this one and uh decided to play it safe. I just sat that first night, um, I kinda snuck into this one area on this one side of the creek that I that I was stuck on, um, that I could at least see into a larger section of timber across the creek. Um, so I could at least see something. And I thought to myself, well if I shoot something across the creek, there's no way I'm getting it tonight. So I'm like, I'll shoot it and I'm not gonna be able to track or do anything. I'm gonna have to leave and figure out some way to get over there. Um, but that never happened because I never saw a thing. Um, but then that night I got to thinking about what my other options were and I figured the best thing to do would be see if, you know, the best case scenario would be if I could get permission to access my property from the backside through the neighbor. Um, cause there's a road that runs on the backside of this block. So I ended up doing that, talked to this guy and he allowed me to do that. So I was able to access the property the second two days from the, you know, the, the dry side of the property. Um, but things didn't improve from there. So it was just a rough, rough few days. Right. It's that time of year, man. You know it just as well as I do and everybody listening. It it's just shuts down. And you know, that's what I want to talk about today, Dan, is um is this late season time period. And we're going to talk about it, you know, over the next couple of weeks um leading here through the end of the season, but I thought we'd kick off this late season discussion for us this week kind of talking through your plans and my plans kind of what our, our tactics and strategies are going to be for this time of year, um, but then also talk about those implicit challenges and the problems that, you know, we've all 
um, encountered during the late season and that, you know, we might be anticipating this time of year. And, you know, from my perspective, you know, what you just said there, you know, the fact that it just shuts down, it can be the case in a lot of situations and a lot of people encounter that. Um, but then on the other, the flip side of the coin, when you're in the right situation and you have the right variables in your favor, it can be some of the absolute best hunting in the world. I mean, right. I know some guys that specifically plan for the late season with their properties and how they hunt and everything. And they're, they're, there's no better chance throughout the entire year of catching a mature big buck on his feet than during the late season when you have the right things lined up. So right. it's one of those things that's very hot or cold. It's very hit or miss. Um, it's feast or famine. There's, October, October lull. Yeah, kind of that kind of deal. Um, so, so I thought... You know, we could kick it off here. You know, I, I outlined my Indiana trip there. Um, it was rough. So I thought maybe to illustrate some of the points I want to make, I thought I'd start talking about that Indiana trip and what my thought process was for why I thought things might work out there and then what I think ended up hurting me. And maybe that can transition us then from there into talking about your plans in Iowa, my plans in Michigan, and then we can bounce around, talk through some of the different ideas um, and challenges. So... What do you think, Mr. Johnson? Does that sound like a good plan? Yes, it does. Awesome. So, you know, with Indiana, like I mentioned, um, the big thing I thought I had going for me was late season food. Now, I think you'd agree, I think most would agree, that that's probably the most important factor for late season success, that the deer are going to be where the food is. They've just come off of the rut, the most physically stressful time of the year for, for bucks, most certainly. Um, I can't, can't remember what the number is, but I, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere around 20 to 30%. Bucks lose 20 to 30% or somewhere around there, that percentage of their body weight during the rut. They get completely famished. They're as you know, they're running almost nonstop. They're chasing does. They're, um, you know, exerting a tremendous amount of energy. So when December rolls around, the rut kind of fades away. These deer, the the most important thing on their minds is recouping that energy, bulking up on nutrition, getting food in their system to to recover from the rut, and then to prepare for the winter. So, with that being the case, deer focus their entire lives at this time of year around really high quality winter food sources. And because of that, from my perspective and, and most others, you know, your hunting strategy this time of year needs to revolve around food, identifying what those quality winter food sources are, identifying the ones that are actually being hit by deer at that time, and then finding a way to, to get in there and hunt those deer. Um, but there's, you know, there's so many other variables that, that play into that equation, but, but food is the number one thing. And so in Indiana, I had that food, I had this massive cornfield, uh, adjacent to my Indiana property that I thought for sure deer would be feeding. You know, corn is one of the best late season food sources because very high, very high in carbohydrates, which deer are looking for at this time of year. That really is what it's like the, the coal in the furnace for a deer that really gives them the calories and energy they need to, to handle the cold temperatures. So cornfield is great. Unfortunately, in my case, I had lots of food. I had no deer. And I think there was two reasons why I wasn't seeing the deer. Well, <clears throat> there could be several. Um, there just might not be any darn deer in the area, <laughs> which based on my sightings is somewhat indicative of the situation. But two things I think specifically hurt me. One was a lack of late season bedding cover. So you need the food, but you also need the bedding. Um, and Bedding is one of those things that decreases in, you know, quantity just as much as food does throughout the year. So, you know, Dan, during the summer when we're out there scouting, it's thick everywhere, right? The undergrowth is lush. There's tons of leaves, tons of cover, um, grass and shrubs and, and everything. Deer are in thick, great, secluded cover almost anywhere they go during the summer. But when you fast forward to December, I mean, if we walk through... 80% of the woods that, you know, most guys are hunting, it's wide open, right? It's just open understory. And that's not the kind of cover that deer want to bed in during the late season. So they start shifting their bedding habits to those few remaining places that are really thick. And some properties have that and some properties don't. And this spot in Indiana, it, it does not have much of that. There's a couple little spots with some good cover still at this point, but it's very isolated. And because of that, I don't think I had many deer relating to that cover. Um, 
Now, the second thing that was going against me was the weather. And this is a big thing that I think we'll talk about for our entire conversation today. But um, I'm a big believer, and I'm a big believer of this all year round. You know, as you know, we talk about it a lot. Um, but weather, especially temperature and snow, precipitation at this time of year, is a huge variable in, in deer activity and movement during daylight. I love a good cold front. I love a good snowstorm. What I hate is warmer than average temperatures. And that's what we have right now in Indiana and in Michigan. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's what you have in Iowa right now, but it's been warm. And, you know, these deer are wearing their winter coats right now. And it's it's like, you know, you or me right now. It's 50 degrees here in Michigan. I'm not going to walk around in a big puffy jacket and a winter hat because it's just uncomfortable. So the same thing, those bucks and all those deer out there, they're doing the same thing. They're slowing down. They're not moving till it's cooler at night. There's just not that extra urgency to get moving during daylight. So, you know, at a high level, those are the two big things that I think were hurting me in Indiana from a, from a late season timing standpoint. Um, now, there's a whole slew of other things that I want to talk about when it comes to what I think, you know, I could be looking for in Michigan moving forward. But, you know, maybe to transition us from this, you know, here's what was going bad for me in Indiana. That was my plan in Indiana. Um, Dan, I want to first now talk about what you have going on. You know, what what are your plans for Iowa? I know you got permission from the wife to uh, hunt a couple more weekends there in Iowa during the late season. So can you walk us through your plan and maybe are, if any of the factors I just talked about, if those are things you're looking for or if there's anything else, any other variables that are going to be tossed into the equation for you, you know, what are those? Yeah, obviously weather is the big one. Um, over the years I found, you know, I may not even get into my tree stand until 40 minutes, 45 minutes to maybe an hour before the sun goes down, just knowing that the deer are not going to move until right at last light. This is just what I've seen it on my properties. Got to find that food source, um, standing crops. Um, and as you know, I kind of have a little problem uh, where I hunt because there's some other really good managed property uh, around me that has standing, standing crops all year round. And that those properties act like a sponge when the, when the snow comes, it gets cold. They, they change their bedding areas and, and my properties kind of dry up a bit. Now, as far as like a strategy is concerned, uh, it, it all starts this weekend. I'm actually heading back home for a family Christmas and I'm going to go out and I'm going to see if there are any standing crops. I'm going to do some scouting. Um, I took down all my trail cameras because of uh, I've had issues in the past with uh, people uh, going onto the properties when uh, the, the shotgun season starts. And that's the, that's the really big obstacle is the pressure from the shotgun. Um, there's multiple groups of guys. They don't coordinate. So they're in and out of there all the time driving these deer out of the area and into these uh, low pressure, heavily managed properties with standing food and they just don't come back until the spring. So as far as a strategy is concerned, I'll, I'll be hunting, um, try to find that food source. To be honest with you, I'm not really looking for um, any particular buck. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be shooting does. Now uh, the first doe that walks by is gonna be getting an arrow um, still, you know, debating if I actually want to lower my standards for a, a buck this year and maybe just, sh you know, shoot the first thing that walks by, maybe a spike or I don't know. I, I, all these ideas are running through my head, but, uh, talk, talk to me a little more about that. Are you, are you being serious? Like you would really shoot the first buck you saw or yeah. Um, now if it's a spike, yes, maybe a button buck for sure. But I, I, I said to myself, you know, I, I tried to do the whole brown it's down thing the last day that this, this, my vacation. And I had a three and a half year old come by my stand who I believe in two years could be that next, you know, Boone and Crockett giant, damn near 200 inch deer. If it's an eight pointer and it comes by and it's a smaller buck, I don't know. Maybe I spoke too soon, I, but I haven't shot a deer in a couple of years. So 
I may, two things happen. If it's a spike, I may shoot it. If it's a button buck, I will shoot it. Or if it's a doe, I could still use my tags for, uh, use my, my, any sex tag for, a for a doe too. So basically it's the first three does that come by are going to get an arrow. Um, if I have my two, my two, uh, doe tags already filled, which, you know, this is all hypothetical and a spike walks by, I'll probably shoot a spike. And this is purely just cause you want some more venison. Yeah. That's, that's a majority of it. Um, but I don't know, just like to hunt. I I've, I'm kind of coming to a crossroads this season. And I think me and you've talked about this a lot of in from the, from the filming aspect of it and how, how tedious it is at times to get into a tree, set up your camera equipment, tear it down. Also tear your set down when you're, when you're hunting like me, it's just another um, thing that could possibly go wrong. And which brought me to the point of, okay, yes, I want to shoot mature deer, but I also want to just be a hunter as well. So I don't know. I'm going through this internal turmoil, which, you know, is kind of getting away from the, the, you know, the topic, but I don't know. I, I don't, I, I, I really can't explain it right now. Well, uh, I think this is something we definitely need to, you know, continue to to talk about over the coming weeks because I think it's yeah. something that probably a lot of guys go through. Right. Um, a lot of people I imagine make that shift eventually into wanting to target more mature deer or bigger deer. And they go at that for a few years, maybe two years or five years or however long it is. And then at some point, some people, you know, know they want to stick with that. And then other people, you know, encounter setbacks like you have recently or different yeah. things that make you start questioning that and make you want to go back to just hunting. Um, and that's understandable in a lot of ways. So I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, where your mind's at after this next weekend of hunting that you get, um, once you've processed some of that stuff. So let's make sure to revisit that. And, yeah. um, I think, uh, I think a lot of people will be interested to, to look into, um, into your mindset in that, because I think it's something that so many people can relate to. Um, right. so it's just, it's just crazy because, you know, it, these these mature bucks, and as you know, and as everybody knows, are truly a hundred percent different creature. And this year, we had all these encounters with these with these three year olds that were, and, and maybe one or two four year olds that were standing right in front of us. But we knew they were young, and we knew they could get to that next level. So I don't know, man. I don't know. Now, well. I guess we'll let's let's table that for a little bit. Okay. Go out there, hunt, think about it, let us know how it goes, and let's yeah. talk about this a little more detail next time. And um, hopefully you've got a big buck on the ground that you can tell us about. Yeah, we don't um, even need to have the conversation because I shoot you know, I shoot a booner. And then <laughs> I'm just like, Yeah, I've been holding out for these guys all all year. <laughs> But I, I totally get it. I mean, it's something that I've I've struggled with too. And, and even like this year in Michigan, I'm like, man, I just want to, even though I had success already in Ohio, I'm like, man, I, I'd love to shoot a deer with my bow in Michigan really badly. And does that mean I, do I change my standards? Do I just not shoot any buck? Do I give up on hunting bucks because there just isn't one to my standards? Or do I still, I don't know. Um, it's something I'm sure a lot of people struggle with. So I'm glad you brought it up though, Dan. I'll, so, put, it to you, I'll put it to you this way. Let's say that the government decided to stop all hunting. All right, T today there's no more hunting. It's illegal to go out and kill a deer. I would, for fun and for excitement, I would still probably take vacation during this time, that time of year, and go sit in a tree stand. Yeah, if okay. that make that's crazy to think, but you know, you know, in wacko world. That makes all the sense in the world. It's yeah. funny you mentioned that. Um, we're really going off on tangent here, but I'll just say this. Um, I thought about the exact same thing this past weekend. So yeah. I guess you know, this is relatable too because I'll tell this story. So I'm down there in Indiana hunting by myself, and then my, uh, my buddy Josh, he is hunting our property down in Ohio because he still didn't fill his tag. Um, so he's down there in Ohio, and he's telling me about the deer he's seeing, and we're looking at trail camera pictures. Um, and even though I filled that tag, I literally thought about just going down there and sitting in a tree with my camera just to see these deer. Um, especially on that property where I've got, you know, there's so many of these, you know, 
all the different stories that are going on in this property. My, my hunt with Jawbreaker and Glenn, the buck I missed last year, and all these different big bucks that I've been catching on trail camera that I've been seeing and having encounters with. I want to be down there, and I want to see these deer and just watch them and capture them on film and, and be able to talk about those stories. Um, that's what is so riveting for me. Um, so I really seriously considered just scrapping the Indiana hunt and just driving down the extra hour to Ohio and just sitting in a tree and, and watching. Yeah. Um, I came really close to doing it. I just realized I had to actually get back here to do this podcast and catch up on some other work. But if it wasn't for that, um, I probably would have done that. And I still might go back down in January just to sit and, uh, I'll have my bow and I could shoot a doe if I saw one. Um, but yeah, there's not a whole lot. It's not really a doe hunting farm. There's not a whole lot of them, but, um, yeah, I would just love to see a couple of these deer again because, um, just fascinating animals, fascinating creatures. I love being out in the wild and seeing these animals and learning about them. Um, but, but man, we are really going off in wild direction here, <laughs> but let's get back to it. Let's get back to it. Let's get back to it. I agree. Um, so you just told us about your plans in Iowa, right? You're going to go look yep. for food. You're going to, uh, kind of figure things out as you go, but hopefully come across a good food source and then, you know, take advantage of whatever opportunities might come. Um, now one good thing here is, we don't have snow. We, we don't have a lot of snow on the ground. We, we don't have any snow on the ground right now. Now, a lot can happen in the next three weeks um, because my first day back in the tree stand is going to be the very first weekend in January and then the Friday night and Saturday night of the following weekend. So if there's no snow, it makes things even harder because there is – there is still a, we had a huge acorn crop this year and there's going to be a ton of acorns all over the timber and what the snow does um, is just helps concentrate these deer into the food sources so into the egg fields so i'm going to have a lot of you know kind of hoping and praying for basically terrible weather um, those last two weeks and when i mean terrible weather i'm talking in the negatives the negative numbers um, not really bad wind because they'll sit down for 24 hours, even with terrible wind. Um, so extremely cold temperatures and, uh, maybe, maybe some snow on the ground to at least cover everything that helps get, uh, things, uh, you know, they'll, they'll start grouping up more. You'll see more deer. And if you can find that food source, man, that's where it's at. Yeah. I am right there with you. Um, and I think, you know, my, uh, maybe let me describe my perfect ideal late season setup and hunt. And I think maybe that'll help us kind of talk through some of these issues. Um, in addition to what you just did there, because a lot of everything ties right into that. Um, but I mean, setting the stage, right? Like we talked about, these bucks have been hunted for the past two months or more. So these deer are on edge. They've been heavily pressured, um, like in their situation, you know, guys doing drives to the property. These deer are not like they used to be in early October. They're not going to handle additional hunting pressure well at all. So, you know, there's very little room for air here. So they're heavily pressured. Now, like we talked about already, quality late season bedding cover is limited. So they're going to be spending time when they do bedded in these limited areas of quality bedding cover. And then the most important thing, like you just talked about, is those food sources. And for the most part, you know, in some cases, like you talked about, there's going to be lots of acorns and things, but more than at any other time of the year, great food is a limited uh, resource for deer. So like you said, you got to find those isolated food sources where you can, um, you know, where those deer are going to eventually congregate and funnel to. So you've got less food, less cover, lots of pressure. What really comes down to during the late season for me, in my opinion, and you can tell me if you think differently, but I'm pretty sure we're on the same page here, is it really comes down to almost, um, you need to, it needs to be a drone strike. You don't get a lot of opportunities during the late season, but when those couple right opportunities appear, you need to take advantage of it and take advantage of it perfectly. So I'm looking for a few things, these couple ideal conditions. And then when I see them, I'm going to go in and I'm going to strike hard. Um, now, what you're doing here depends on whether you have property you can manage the habitat or if you don't. Um, I'll give an example of a property that I can manage, and then we can talk about different things like a situation like yours where you don't actually manage that habitat. You need to just work with what nature gives you. Um, but 
on one of my Michigan properties that I hunt, I can plant food plots and do habitat, you know, improvements and whatnot. So what I do is I specifically plan some of my food plot plantings and some of my work on bedding cover to obtain that quality late season food and late season cover. So I've gone into a number of these spots that are already good bedding areas and I've done a bunch of hinge cutting, which is, you know, cutting a tree partway in half, small trees, and then bending them down so they stay connected to the, to the trunk. But the top of the tree is down horizontal to the ground. And what that does is it brings that cover of the treetop down to the ground level, but then that tree stays alive, produces new shoots, new leaves, and also opens up the canopy so more sunlight comes in this area so you get more grassy cover, brush, and stuff like that. So I've done that in this property in several areas over the past few years, and it's created these clusters of really thick additional cover that stays thick during the winter. So I've got good late-season bedding. And then I'm going, and I'm like I mentioned, planting late season food plots that are going to be productive this time of the year. And my favorite food plot um, for a guy like me who doesn't have a lot of land or big equipment or anything, something that you can plant in relatively small quantities is um, brassicas. So brassicas are things like rape, kale, turnips, um, that kind of thing. They're these big leafy kind of lettuce type greens um, that deer just love during the late portions of winter really cold temperatures a good frost makes these leaves really kind of sugary and sweet to deer and um, very attractive so what i'll do is um you know we had the rut i was hunting the rut gun season happens i pull out of most of my good michigan properties during the gun season and kind of let them become a sanctuary and then once the late season comes around now i'm gonna wait for these perfect conditions because i've got really good late season food and i've got really good late season bedding so i know most likely where those deer bedded. I know most likely where those deer will be feeding. It's just a matter now of catching those couple nights when the big buck I'm hunting will actually move towards that food source during daylight. And so my whole strategy now revolves around picking those right couple days because I'm a firm believer, Dan, um, that if you're going in there, you're hunting a lot during the late season, you're going to ruin your your situation because these deer are so on edge. They've been pressured all hunting season. You just can't, all the things that, you know, even though I I preach it all the time, right? We talk about low pressure all year, Um, but sometimes you can get away with something in October. You might make a mistake in October, blow a deer off a food source or something, and then still see them a couple weeks later. Um, You'll get some forgiveness. But in my opinion, I don't think you get that forgiveness in in the middle of December because they've been bumped and pushed and bothered for weeks and weeks and weeks. At this point, you know, if you screw it up one more time, for most of these deer, especially a big old deer, he's going to say, forget this. I'm not dealing with this right now. So I think you have to wait until the couple right situations to, to risk that pressure. And so what I'm looking for are a couple of things you talked about. One, frigid, nasty, cold temperatures. You know, just like you said, you want that toe-numbing cold because that's really going to get deer on their feet. And if you're hoping for some additional daylight activity, those frigid, cold days will be the ones where there's a chance that your big boy is going to move a little bit before dark. Number two, again, just like you said, snow. Um, it's going to cover up food sources like acorns, like you said. It's also just going to it's going to cover up all sorts of different types of food sources that normally would be easily accessible. Now those deer need to search around a little bit more. They need to dig up things a little more. And with that cold and that snow, deer just want to get up and feed um, sooner. It helps them get moving around, warms them up a little bit. So really, I'm waiting for a huge cold front or good snowstorm. When those two things hit, then I'm going to think, okay, now where's the very most likely spot they're going to head to feed? And then I'm going to move in there and I'm going to hunt it when those conditions are just right. And that's kind of what my whole late season revolves around is waiting for those perfect conditions. When I get them, I'm going to go in and I'm going to hunt it and it's going to be kind of high risk, high reward. I'm either going to get that kill or I'm going to get an opportunity or or come close or it's just not going to work out at all. Um, One other thing I would say, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, Dan, because, you know, we've. Um, this is something we talked about during the early season too, when we had slightly differing viewpoints. Um, but during the late season, I again tend to avoid morning sits for the exact same reasons why I avoid morning six during the early season. I avoid them during the late. What's your opinion on that? Well, that's great. If you are, uh, a food source hunter, um, for me, I have had some good success in the mornings, uh, late season, as far as, um, Okay, so the past couple of years, I have tried this tactic. Go into a bedding area knowing I am like late in the day, 
knowing you're not going to hunt it from the opposite side. So you find the food source and you find their bedding area. You bump the deer towards the food source. Okay. Set up. And then just like early season on a, on a bump and dump, a run and gun type setup, there, they go back to a pattern. They're going back to a pattern and yeah, there is some pressure, but deer, one thing I've noticed is that in, this only happens one time typically with, with a bed, but they get away. They go, Hey, that bedding area was good. I'm safe there. I caught that problem. And then depending on the wind, you, you hunt it. And when they come back to that bedding area after feeding all night, um, I've done that a couple times um, with some does and have been successful late season because of that. Yeah, the old bump and dump. Yep. That, uh, that is something that, I mean, I've heard of it time and time again. It can definitely work. And it's, uh, would you agree, though, that, like you said, it's usually like one shot. Right. If you go in there and you don't pull it off that first time, you're especially when I mean with does you might get away with a little bit more, but if if we're talking a mature deer, you get maybe one shot, maybe another one if you're lucky, but probably it's a right it's a swing or miss type proposition. Right. I mean, just like any bump and dump throughout the year, running gun setup throughout the year. If you're bumping a deer, I don't care what time of year it is, you might be able to get away with it once, but you go in there again uh, within a, you know a short period of time and bump them again. They're you know for the most part they're done. Yeah. You're, you're done. So, you know, I think that, I think that early mornings can be still good if you're in a transition, you know, if you're in a pinch point or, or something leading back from a food source to, a, um, you know, to a bed. But I also think not only are they going to the beds after dark, or um, going to the food sources typically after dark, but they're also returning to the foods or to their beds way before light most times. Yeah. So again, it's that cold, crappy weather that's going to to keep them on their feet longer. It's going to force them to eat more, and uh, so so they're preparing for the winter. Yeah, definitely. So I think. Uh, I think we're right on the same page there. Either way, whether you want to go yeah. in the morning or evening, you know, on, on average, yeah. most of the deer, especially the older deer, are going to be waiting till dark to move in the evenings, and they're going to be back to their beds during dark in the mornings, except on these days where these conditions, like we said, are conducive to that extra daylight movement. And so I think either whether you like to hunt evenings or mornings during the late season, that's a like a surefire thing you need to keep in mind is that this time of year, more often than not, it's going to be after dark unless you wait for these right conditions. So, you know, my recommendation, at least for me, I know, you know, when you have time to hunt, a lot of guys, you got to hunt, right? You, you right. just want to be out there and enjoying the, the outdoors and stuff. And so you take advantage of whatever opportunities you have. And I understand that. But if you have flexibility with when you can hunt, I would really, you know, recommend you try to make sure you're not wasting your hunts on those days when it's super warm and lousy, um, mm -hmm. when there's a really low chance of seeing daylight activity and a high chance of, you know, educating deer. I would rather see you hold off on a few hunts and wait till those right conditions and then go in there when you've got a, a higher, you know, higher odds of success. So if you have that flexibility, that's the way to do it, I would say. Um, you know, another thing that I would keep in mind um, is, you know, when you're moving into where you hunt, this is slightly off topic, but related to, to the bedding piece, um, you know, when these deer are moving into bed, whether it be before or after daylight in the morning, during the late season, for the most part, most deer, especially the does, are bedding a lot closer to food. They're not as apt to, you know, travel long distances between food and bedding. If possible, if they have got, if they've got quality cover and near quality food, they want to make their world, as, their world as small as possible this time of year, bucks and does. And so this is great if you can find out where that is. Because then, like you said, these deer are back on those patterns, and they're tighter patterns usually than at any other time um, because of those limiting factors. So um, if you can find that little patch, you could be in the money. But you also have that super high risk of blowing it too because the deer are much more concentrated. And so I know I've, I've had this happen. Um, I thought if I found out where deer were feeding in the, um, in the afternoons, and I had seen several nights in a row a bunch of deer feeding out into this cut cornfield. Um, 
I didn't know where they're betting. So one day I packed up some stuff and I was going to head in and I was going to try to hunt just the field edge. I was just trying to just to see what was going on. I thought I could get to the edge of the field and observe. Well, I'm hiking in and I kind of crest over a slight hill. And as I crest over that hill, I can see the edge of the field and I can see where I want to hang my tree stand. And as soon as I get over that hill, like 25 white tails burst out of the tall grass and brush behind, um, behind my tree where I was going to hang it up. They were betting not 15 yards off the field. And, um, that's something I've seen time and time again. These deer, you know, in situations where they can, they want to bed close to that food. So you need to plan for that and, and identify whether or not you can get into the spot you want to hunt in the afternoon um, without spooking deer. And, you know, keep that in mind when you're accessing your stand, too. If you're going to go walking past an area that's close to a field edge where they might be bedded, you need to compensate for that. Um, so just another, you know, these are things that kind of are, are general rules that we talk about and follow throughout the entire season, right? I mean, early right. season's the same deal. Um, but I just feel like it's exaggerated at this time of year, in my opinion. Um, everything becomes a little bit thinner ice that you're walking on. Um, yep. And so I just think if at any time of year that you're willing to be detail oriented, this is the time to do it. Um, Ironically and unfortunately, it's also the time of year that for most of us, we become the least detail oriented, right? Because we've been hunting for two months, we're tired, we're maybe down on our luck, we're frustrated. Um, and so sometimes with those types of uh, feelings, I guess, we tend to get a little lazy, or at least I do sometimes, right? You're frustrated, sometimes you start glossing over the details, but you have to try to fight that because now is the time that those things are the very most important. So... I think that's that for me, the, the, the late season is all about battling fatigue, almost mental fatigue, yeah. hunting fatigue. It's all about, you know, maintaining that mental edge and then executing on when you, when you need to do it in the right ways, keeping all the details in mind, executing in the right way at the right time without letting that fatigue and um, exhaustion of the whole season weigh you down. Because if, if you can pull it off, it can be great hunting, but you can very easily, blow things if you're if you're not really dotting your i's and crossing your t's yep so one quick um tip and this bit is this is based off if your state allows it or not but because the movement is you know after dark a lot of the times on this late season i like to use a spotlight and i will go around to different areas that i can hunt and I'll glass or I'll, I'll spotlight the, the, uh, the fields after the sun, you know, after dark and after the sun goes down, get an idea of where they may be coming out at and then jump into the timber where you see these deer and then work your way back in, follow a trail if there's snow on the ground or, um, you know, a low spot where your fingers or something like that. And then dump back in because typically they'll have some kind of a staging area or they'll, they may stand up out of their bed and they won't go straight to the bedding area. They may mill around an area for a little bit before, um, you know, before the coast is clear, so to speak. So spotlight might be a good idea if your state allows it. If not, um, tough luck. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, that's something I've you know, always talk about doing more often. Um, and I never, well, I occasionally do it, but it's, it's a great tactic. Another right. thing you could do too, and again, this, there's some inherent risk in this, you know, as we're talking about the, the need to, you know, maintain as low pressure of an environment as you can. Um, but if you're in an area, if maybe you, maybe you had the right conditions and you headed into hunt and it didn't work out, but when you're walking in and out of your stands and stuff, really pay attention to tracks at this time of year too, when, when you have snow cover, because at no other time really do you get as good of an idea um as easily seen tracks at least as when there's snow and, and some depending on the snow cover and stuff you'll be able to see those tracks better or worse but if you can identify a particularly large track you know now's a great time to uh, to use that information see where he's coming in and out of um you know maybe pull a jim shockey and even try to track him so that's um that's another thing to keep in mind is you know just like at any other time of year using all that most recent information that you can come up with, whether it be a, you know, scouting via uh, your spotlight at night, or if you can find tracks, or if you've got trail cameras, you know, 
take all those pieces of the puzzle, put them together, and add that to this to this whole plan and, and piece those things together to find out the right time to strike in the right place. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I've said it before, but I really feel like for me, it's I, I look at it like a drone strike. You have to do that intel. You've got to get your um, your information. And then once you have the best possible um, idea of where that target is, wait for the perfect conditions as best as you can. And then, you know, go in there and kill them. Right. And perfect world works out. Man, you know, more often than not, it's not going to, but sometimes it does. Um, you know, last year it worked out for me. Um, in Michigan, and I've told the story before, so I won't go into detail with it, but you know, the six shooter I killed last December was one of those types of deals. I, 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 I did this exact thing. I had the good food and the good cover on my main Michigan property. I said, okay, I'm not going to hunt at all until I get the right weather and right wind and right conditions. And I waited and waited. And finally I got this big snowstorm come through and the temperatures dropped down through the floor. I headed into my best late season food source that first night after that storm passed and boom, I had an encounter with six shooter. Now it didn't work out for me that night, but I almost did. Now fast forward four days later, two things that happened. Number one, the wind it had been windy the next couple of days after that storm still passed. Um, the wind finally died down. We now had like six inches of snow, freezing cold, and this is the first day after that wind settled. It had been blowing hard. Now it was down to almost nothing, two, three miles an hour. Really cool, really crisp, great weather for a hunt. Now I had seen six shooter back on one of my food pl- near one of my food plots on this property, but I didn't get that uh, that opportunity. Now. A couple days later, I hear from a neighbor that he'd spotted a big buck on the opposite side of this property on another farm I can hunt, feeding in a cut cornfield. So now I've got another piece of intel. All right, big buck's on this cornfield. The wind just died down, um, and my wind direction was perfect to sneak into this spot um, and get away with what I thought would be a wind I could live with, but would be a wind that any deer coming out to feed would think would be relatively in their favor. So that's what I did. I, I went straight in. I got this piece of intel. I found a way to sneak in really carefully so that I wouldn't spook any deer. You know, as you know, I literally crawled on all fours along the side of this hill so that I wouldn't expose myself to any deer that might be bedded in the timber inside because I, I was really confident that they weren't bedding far from the food, again, in this case. And that, that ended up being true. I crept on all fours so I could get around this hillside and then just sat, you know, behind a tree on the ground. And it ended up working out kind of just to a degree as I thought right those deer were not bedded too far away from the food source they got up out of their beds moved into the field tons of does piled into the cornfield feeding um it was just one of those perfect nights where the deer are on their feet moving and getting on that food because it's that first day where really they feel comfortable and um you know as the story goes eventually he did show up and I got the shot so it was one of those situations where you know find the right spot use whatever piece of intel you have and then wait to the right moment and uh I think if you do that you can have really good success during the late season, but you have to have that food um, almost in all cases. That's that's a really big factor. So I think um, I think that might be the hinge that late season success swings on. Yeah, sounds good. What do you think? Are you uh, have I remotivated you to get excited about late season hunting, Dan? Man, I know my property, and it's going to be tough. <laughs> uh, I just, I mean, you can pump me up all you want, but you know the last couple of years that I've sat in, um, you know, either the weather wasn't right, wasn't cold, or I had, uh, oh geez, one day, one day, last day of the season, this is, wasn't last year, but the year before I had an encounter with, you know, they're all grouped up. All these does came through first and I, on my trail camera, I had, um, these these big deer coming through right at last light and then um let's see it was a thursday and the temperature the bottom just dropped right out and that that night when i got in i checked the trail camera and it was it got dark and then i came back the next evening and i know when i checked my trail camera there were daylight daylight pictures of uh um tons of like i think it was they're 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 all shooters this year and they were shooters last year too but um i'm kind of glad i didn't i didn't get an opportunity with them if that makes sense 
but they came by right at last light. And it, to be honest with you, they were just outside of my shooting range. So I didn't take the shot. And, uh, that was really the only good in the past two or three years, the only really good, uh, late season, uh, hunts, hunts I've had because I don't have those standing crops. The only hope that I have this year is that, and I hate to say this as a good thing, but there was a death in one of the farmer's families. And when I left my vacation, they, I, there was a guy out there saying he did not know it could be late. It could even be this winter before they get the crops out of the field. So there is a chance that there's a cornfield still standing and that might be an opportunity for me. Yeah. Well, like you said, really unfortunate circumstances that created that, yeah. but a great, uh, hunting opportunity there. Right. So, for sure. so, you know, as I, uh, I think a lot of people probably relate to what you're talking about there, just about how, you know, it's, it's really always tough this time of year for them and whatnot. And I, um, there's something I wrote recently that I think is, is something to keep in mind. Um, it's something I have to tell myself a lot too, cause I'll, I'll get down about it too. But even now, even when, you know, times are kind of tough, pickings are slim, there's a chance, right? There's a chance you can be out in the woods and you might get that shot. Right. And three months from now, Dan, you and me are going to be sitting here on the podcast talking about deer and the season's going to be closed. And we would probably give anything to have a chance to go in a tree and shoot a deer, right? Right. We dream about that all year. So right now we have that chance. It might be a slim one, but we have it. So uh, I'd encourage all the listeners out there to uh, to take advantage of that. And uh, and who knows what will happen. That's a fact, Jack. That is. So what do you think? Should we uh, should we wrap things up here? I think, first off, we need don't we need to uh, announce a contest winner? Well, we do, but I don't know. Do you? I don't know. It doesn't seem like people want those Onyx anyways, right? And there's not a whole lot of interest, is there? I don't think so. No. Not a lot. Not a, th- I can't believe how many people signed up for this. <laughs> I think there's a lot of folks that are uh, excited to give an Ozonics a try. So, so Dan, you want to uh, want right. to tell us who's going to win this thing? Well, let me pick right now. Okay. Um, can you do your best attempt at a drum roll? Yeah. Can you hear this? Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. And it is. Okay. We are looking at John Steinhauer. John, John Steinhauer. Steinhauer. I just randomly went through it, um, and he is the winner of the Ozonics. So I'll get a hold of John and uh, let him know that he won. Now, next week, we're also going to be doing another giveaway, and that's for we're going to have two winners next week. And that's for two different stick and picks. So same thing as what we did with the Ozonics. Um, you got to like the post. You got to like uh, the Facebook of Wired to Hunt, uh, the Nine Finger Chronicles. We're going to be giving away two stick and picks. We're going to pick two winners. And so con- first off, congratulations to, to John for winning the Ozonics. Yeah. And then, you know, two more. Uh, winners next week and then you know who knows what we're going to have the following week we may have some more uh, free stuff to give away i think so and uh just for anyone that doesn't know what a stick and pick is right dan it's uh it's a trail camera stand that you know you can stick in the ground there's a couple different models i'm not sure which one you have but it's a really cool way to to get your trail camera in locations that maybe there's not a tree at all or the right tree Um, i've really come to love mine so uh, Uh, it's a great it's a great product to get your hands on yeah I'm, i'm i'm getting to the point now where I almost would rather have my camera on a stick and peck than on a tree. Yeah, they're they're pretty darn handy. So that's yeah. uh, that'll be another cool giveaway next week. So, all right, John Steinhauer, is that right? John Steinhauer. Yep. All right, John's the man. Well, John. Dan, you'll be getting in touch with John, and um, we'll have all this information on wiredtohunt.com as well. That's wiredtohunt.com/slash episode. 35 this week um so keep an eye out for more details and i guess i'll wrap up the show here call it uh call it a day so hope you guys enjoyed the show um you know this will be our topic over the next couple weeks we're going to keep on talking about different things related to the late season um and hopefully can help you guys kind of close out the year on a on a high note uh, put some venison in the freezer and maybe even tag that big old buck you've been chasing 
if you have enjoyed the show, you know, as we always say, if you could leave us a rating or review on iTunes, it would be incredible. Um, I can't tell you how much this helps us out. Um, we've already gotten way more reviews than almost any other podcast in the in kind of similar category as us. And I think it's because you guys are taking the time and effort to, to share your thoughts on the podcast and, um, it's helping a lot. So I appreciate that. And, um, I can't talk a whole lot about what's coming, but there's just some really cool stuff coming for the podcast. Um, I'm super top excited secret. about it. Top secret. Top secret. Um, Dan, you don't even know some of this stuff, so it's it's super top secret. <laughs> hey, um, I'm supposed to be your right-hand man. I, I know, but um, basically, Dan, we're removing you as a co-host, and okay. it's just, just going <laughs> to... That's what I figured. That's what I figured. <laughs> no, but there's going to be some cool stuff. Um, it just seems like there's a lot of... Great feedback coming in about the podcast, and we're just going to keep on doing more and giving you guys what you want and, and helping you guys out as much as we possibly can and telling these stories. So look for a lot of really neat stuff to come in 2015, and, and the only reason why it's possible is because of you guys. So thank you for that. Like I mentioned, wiredhunt.com slash episode 35 is where you will find the show notes and links from today, uh, including details again about the giveaway that Dan talked about. And uh, anything else that we um, you know think might be relevant to this conversation, I'll put links in there. Uh, as always, we also want to thank our partners who help make this show possible and who keep the lights on in uh, in my house here at the Wired Hunt headquarters. So big thank you to Sika Gear, Trophy Ridge, Bear Archery, Redneck Blinds, Carbon Express Arrows, Huntsoft, Lacrosse Boots, Big and J Long Range Attractants, and the Whitetail Institute of North America. That all said, thank you so much for joining us here today on the Wired Hunt podcast. Take advantage of the late season. Take advantage of that chance because not too long from now, you're going to be sitting on the couch wishing you could be hunting. But right now, you can be. So get out there, hunt hard, and stay wired to hunt.